so let's uh, I'll show you this movie which now works So let's see if it works. <laughs> okay, this is what uh, this is the structure. We focus on the backbone, and then on the backbone, we identify the alpha carbons. The alpha carbons connect them by springs. So this is the network representation of the structure, not your familiar ribbon diagram network representation. Then we, this is the slowest mode, mode one. And now this is mode two, okay, for that particular adenate kinase. And then this is mode three. So you have different types of motions for your structure. Let's start again for those of you who missed it. <laughs> it normally starts again, but that one doesn't. Okay, let's see. Okay, here is the structure, the back one. From the PDB, we identify the alpha carbons, place beads at the alpha carbons. These are the beads of your network. And we connect all pairs within a cutoff distance, which is usually 7 to 10 angstrom. Uh, I'll, I'll explain that. Now you have, and then we evaluate the modes. Mode 1, mode 2 in this chain, and then mode 3. They are all different. You may not perhaps see them, but they are all different. So we have, these are the softest or slowest three modes for that particular enzyme, uh, which are relevant to its function. We will stop. Uh, now I will keep going. Uh, now in the uh, Gaussian network model, this is a review of what. <laughs> Uh, as I mentioned, we have this database where all the results are listed, okay? Uh, and uh, when uh, Hong Chan published that last year, he had compiled data for about 95% of the PDB, and it keeps uh, getting bigger and bigger because it's synchronized with the PDB. The only thing is that uh, a few very big structures like I think he did 97 percent. The remain they are not available there probably. I, but in general, you know, 97, 95 percent of the structures. And what this also does, usually the protein uh, coordinates are listed for let's say one subunit. But then this is a tetramer, and the PDB file allows you to construct the others by symmetry considerations to build what is called the biological assembly. Biological assembly is the functional unit, short name is BA. So the results are here reported for the BAs, biological assemblies, which are really relevant uh, usually. So you want to use this database, especially if you are from biological background or, or if you don't like, uh, you know, if you don't feel very comfortable, comfortable programming, but just uh, using a resource, that's a good resource. Okay, 95%. Uh, uh, some of the structures are really huge. So there are 13.9% of the structures in the database. They contain more than 1,000 nodes. So we're talking about really big structures. And uh, so th and for about 40,000 of them are have uh, coordinates for the biological assembly different from what's repor reported is the asymmetric unit in the PDB. So these have been processed and all the results are given. You can do it for protein DNA complexes. I haven't heard anyone doing research on that. Protein DNA, oh you do, you do, that's great. Or you can do for membrane proteins or you can do anything uh, and you can visualize the uh, results. Now, as I mentioned, there is an important property, collectivity of the motions. The global motions are very collective, I explained. And there is a measure of collectivity. Now, if you look at this, this is uh, the eigenvector. In the eigenvector, this is the k eigenvector. 
I'm sorry, this is the eight eigenvector in this case. We are summing over eigenvectors. And this is for raised to k. So this is the kth element of eigenvector i, uh, which gives you a measure of the si um, size of the motion in that particular mode. So it's like a probability of moving in that mode. And this expression for those from physical background, it's like an expression for entropy, where you have a summation of pi ln pi, p being the probability. Anyway, that is, uh, this is a measure of collectivity. And we report, in some cases, in some examples, which I need to point out, uh, the slowest motion that takes place is just the swinging of a tail. Okay, which may be important, but in most cases, uh, to me, it's not so interested, it's interesting. I want to see the really movements of the different domains with respect to each other. Now, if it's the, same, the large movement of a tail only, everything else not moving, it's not collective, right? It is just because it just involves the this tail, not the entire protein. So usually, usually, the softest mode, the global mode, will be most collective. But in some cases, this, uh, you have the tail movement, something which is very, very low frequency motion, but not collective. So we like to check the collectivity also and select the most collective motions. Okay? So that's something uh, that's reported in the PDB, the collectivity. It's uh, an entropy-like quantity, as I mentioned. Now I'm moving. The Gaussian network model, everything was n by n, do you remember? It is as if we are dealing with an n-dimensional space for n residues. Uh, each of them has its own directional uh, motion. But in reality, each of them, in our world, they move in three dimensions, right? So we need actually an eigenvector uh, to answer, what was your name? Yeah. Misa. Isa? Misa. Misa. Uh, to, um, the question that Misa asked was, what is the, you know, the type of eigenvector? This is a, actually a 3n dimensional vector for a protein of n residues, or for a structure of n residues. The first three elements are the xyz components of residue 1, how much it moves. The second is the xyz of residue 2, xyz of residue 3, etc. So the eigenvector that you get from the ANM will give you exactly in the, our three-dimensional space how much each residue moves in each mode, OK? This is the ANM. So we construct, for, this is the structure. We construct the ANM same way. You might ask, how do you select the cutoff distance for connecting residues? Well, there is a reason why we select uh, uh, a certain distance. This is based on statistical examination of structures in the PDB. We would like to connect everything that is within the first coordination shell, not the second ones. So that's why the way we select the, in the in the GNM we use seven angstrom, ten angstrom. It doesn't matter much. In the ANM, now we're dealing in more details about the XYZ components. We take a larger distance between ten to fifteen angstrom, twelve to sixteen, if you like. Instead of the uh, Kirchhoff matrix in the of the GNM. In the ANM, we have what's called the Hessian matrix, H. The Hessian matrix is, uh, uh, is a 3n by 3n matrix <coughs> composed of 3 by 3 blocks, n by n such blocks for each residue. So this is the IG. So think of a 3n by 3n matrix. And each element is or an n by n matrix where each element is not anymore a scalar but a 3 by 3 matrix. Okay? So each element is a super element, we call that. The super RJ element is a 3 by 3 matrix. Uh, so it is essentially uh, the counterpart of the Kirchhoff matrix in the ANM where we expand things to 3n dimensions. Okay? And then you have mode 1 is, for example, the relative motions of those two the way you showed, most of you showed mode 1. Mode 2 could be a twisting motion in this case. Or mode 20 is a more localized motion where some, a, a small part of the molecule moves. Just examples. So mode 1, uh, when we show it along the, uh, the displacement versus energy, 
mode 1, each mode is a fluctuation. It moves back and forth along this mode direction. This is the mode axis now. And here the curvature is relatively more uh, smoother, you know, not as steep as this one, because it is a low frequency mode, OK? Mode 2 will be uh, steeper, and mode 20 will be even you know, sharper like that. So the idea is for a given energy increment, here you move, you have a little motion. Therefore, the same energy increment, you undergo a larger motion. Are you with me? Here is a more detailed description of the Hessian matrix, as I mentioned. 3N uh, by 3N matrix. <laughs> this is a matrix. There are entries here, OK? One of the entries here is itself. So y there are n by n boxes. So each box itself is a three, uh, three by three matrix. And what it literally means, which I what each element literally means, is the second derivative of the potential. So the potential, uh, it looks complicated, but it's not. Uh, it is, again, uh, the, the distance Rij between raised to i and j with respect to the original distance. Uh, square of it, typical of a harmonic potential. This uh, complicated thing just is uh, called a step function, which selects all raised to pairs that are within a distance of RC, cutoff distance of 10 Armstrong. So this is uh, when you sum over all raised Jews, you have a filter if you like. You select only those raised to pairs that are within uh, this distance. To co to a s then you place a spring there. And the spring deformation from the original distance is given by this quadratic function multiplied by a uniform force constant. This is the total potential for a deformed structure, OK? Instantaneous positions, Rij. Now, remember, for a spring, what is uh, the potential? Potential is 1 half spring constant times deformation square, right? You take the first derivative. It gives you the force, Kx. You take the second derivative with respect to x, you, it gives you the force constant k. So uh, here, uh, the Hessian is nothing else than the matrix of the force constant, second derivatives of the potential, with respect to two coordinates. Now you have all the variations of coordinates. You can have xi, 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 yj, etc. So all those derivatives are substituted here. That's the physical meaning. Are you with me? So uh, the Hessian, Hessian is a matrix of force constants associated with uh, the deformations along any pair of coordinates along any axis. So we have 3n by 3n. Uh, that is the background. But the rest, the rest is totally the same thing. Once you have uh, this 3n by 3n matrix, it's just replacing the n by n matrix, Kirchhoff matrix of the GNN. You g get, again, modes. Now, the modes are the three in a three n dimensional space, not n dimension. Okay. And now, the covariance matrix, you remember we had the n by n covariance? It's also three n by three n, because each element is a super element uh, composed of three by three components. Now we decompose the x, y, z components and the correlations between x and y and z directions too. So that's so far about the and the A and M server. Uh, usually, uh, I, users love it. Uh, this is a, one of the most highly cited servers. Uh, I don't know why the name is so complicated. It's not so, uh, so complicated. You can stop here. <laughs> Or if you type a and server, you will immediately uh, find it from, the, from Google search e easily. And it's extremely easy to f use. You enter the PDB code of your structure. Uh, you can use all default parameters. Uh, and uh, for example, this is the, an output for a small protein, cytochrome, which I generated yesterday night. But you are seeing a snapshot. You can see, you will see the beads which correspond to each residue. You can adjust their sizes, etc. The arrows will show you the direction of motion. But what you are seeing, if you do that, if you you can do it instantly, you will see instantly. You see the movie actually, not the uh, 
uh, the snapshot. So it's, it keeps moving. And you can select whichever mode you like, mode one, two, three, and you can generate the movies. You will see the movies immediately. Isn't that fascinating? Yeah. You should do that. <laughs> well, you will you'll do that in this session. And then those soft modes, as I mentioned, are functional. For example, uh, the example I showed was adenate kinase, open and closed forms. These are already in the PDB. So we know that uh, adenate kinase uh, may undergo this type of structural changes. Now suppose I don't know that it can assume a closed state. Suppose I start with the open state. This is the only thing I know. And then I generate, theoretically, what is the first mode or the second mode? Well, this is what I generate. I started with that and I generate this. And look at that. It's so similar. A few lessons to learn from here. The intrinsic modes tell us about what the protein can do, okay? the potential. The protein can undergo this type of, you know, this can be folded like that, this part can be folded, etc. And the protein is going to do these things. This conformation is actually going to be stabilized when it binds its ligand. Okay? So the already when you take the unbound state of the protein in the absence of the ligand, and then you examine what it's likely to do. Now you have a, a, you can generate an ensemble of alternative conformers along the soft modes, which will include actually one of the, at least one of the structures, if there are multiple structures, it could include multiple of them, that have been already observed. Uh, so the protein, when it binds this ligand, is not going to invent a totally new mechanism. It's going to do what its architecture favors. Is that clear? So that's so valuable. So that was an original paper we wrote in PNA. It's one of most, most cited, widely cited. I don't know if I have it, but probably not. Uh, the idea is we've done the calculation for a series of unbound proteins and then evaluated what, uh, and then compared with the bound forms. And in each case, the bound form is just the reconfiguration along a soft mode. So that is, uh, that is what. Uh, now, the for hemoglobin, remember, with this, I don't know if you can see that. This is the tense and relaxed forms. They are different. <laughs> and then I start with the tense form, and I just generate, again, a slow mode. Uh, and this is what I generate. What I generate is very close to the relaxed form, if you can see. <laughs> so that also, uh, you know, the, the, the transition that uh, the hemoglobin undergoes during its function is nothing else than what its architecture already favors along those soft modes. All right. This is the latest dynamics, and I am sure that it's going to be very, very broadly used because it combines both GNM, ANM, and uh, you can do, you, you really you can enter the PDB code. Uh, we don't even need to teach you that. You can use it, start to use immediately. It's so straightforward. But Hong Chan will explain, uh, will give you some uh, illustrations. The website. Now, at the end, we said ENM, elastic network models, because all of them are elastic network models. And you can enter that, and you can do lots of calculations. Now, in addition to what I've described uh, so far, you, as I mentioned, you can do, uh, uh, you can calculate properties like sensors, how if residues, they act as sensors of signals or effectors of signals. There is a, a theory called perturb on perturbation response scanning. James, are you doing your part today or tomorrow? Today. So James will talk about this uh, perturbation response uh, map uh, today. So the idea is the following. <coughs> Suppose you perturb a given residue. What happens to others? How this perturbation is being sensed by others? What is the response of the overall protein? What is the perturbation? Perturbation could be the binding of a ligand. Or you pull it at that position. Or you substitute a new amino acid. There is a uh, mutation at that site. So how that the, this type of uh, structural or energetic perturbation would be sensed by other regions. You can generate a map 
So here is the perturbing residue, here is the response you can have. And we, uh, some of the residues will be very effectively transmitting signals. Uh, these are called effectors. Others uh, s serve as sensors. They are very uh, sensitive to, uh, to external signals and usually located at the ends of the structure. So uh, you will see that it's possible to obtain this type of information. Uh, and he will uh, walk you through that, uh, an application uh, recently published. So this uh, brings us to those allosteric changes in general, uh, how the protein, and the protein or DNA or uh, whichever structure you have, uh, you are analyzing, responds allosterically. Now we're going to, so our series, uh, HIV reverse transcriptase, I don't know if anyone is familiar. This is how it looks like. This is a typical allosteric enzyme. Uh, and people have uh, given names. So that part, that part is called the thumb. It's like an, a thumb. thumb. Uh, this is the fingers. And this part moves with respect to the other part, like uh, fingers. And that's where the DNA, RNA is being bound. Uh, so it, is a, it requires a lot of cooperativity because it has also two functionalities. On the one hand, it acts as a polymerase. And on the other here, there is an RNA H part. So it cuts, processes the RNA. So we have, uh, this is a typical example, which we will uh, show in a while, in a minute, uh, as an allosteric protein. Or another very important utility is uh, you have alternative confirmations. Again, these are, this is the paper I just mentioned, you know, the one where we had a series of unbound proteins and we showed how we can generate their bound forms. So in this case, uh, you see, the, for the same protein, you have the unbound and bound forms. And uh, starting from the, the uh, unbound, I can ge generate the bound form. So the red, the red here, I can, uh, along, if I move along mode one, it's going to be superimposed on the blue, pretty much. So that is uh, what I'm trying to explain. Are you with me? So you, you suppose you know just the unbound, the red one. And uh, based on the mode, it can reconfigure like that. And then where it goes is uh, the already observed bound form. So we have seen that structural changes involved in protein binding correlate with the intrinsic motions that are accessible in the unbound state. Yes? Can you remind us how you rank the different modes? What makes mode one? Most important? Uh, mo mode one is the mode that is uh, the most cooperative, the most collective. Mo Another way of saying is also, you know, most collective means it involves the entire structure. You can see here everything moves. If you want mathematically, mathematically it is the mode that has the first smallest eigenvalue. Uh, or uh, the eigenvalue scales with the frequency. It is the mode that has the smallest frequency, which, is, uh, which also means we call it softest. So it is, uh, uh, it is the direction in which the protein yields, because it's very soft, as opposed to rigid movements, which require a lot of energy. Huh. Okay. So that is, again, a view of the, uh, uh, to uh, also further elaborate. This is your energy landscape bottom, OK? And this is where you sit here, your uh, uh, equilibrium position. Now, mode one will be moving in that direction. As I said, when you move along mode one, you undergo a larger displacement. Mode two is along this direction. And what happens is that Actually, along mode one, you can have another state, substate. These are substates. This will be a global energy minimum. But even in that global energy minimum, you can have multiple substates, right? So this is the original substate, S1. You move along mode one, you get another substate, S2. 
you move along mode 2, you get another substrate, S3. So these substrates are actually functional substrates. Substrates, <laughs> not substrate. <laughs> Subst so the, 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 for example, for this uh, unit, you can have an open form and a closed form. Uh, if you start with the open, you can push it to the, the word to closed form, or vice versa. Usually, usually, by nature, we have a network that uh, if it is closed, it's harder to open it. It likes to be closed. So if it's open, on the other hand, we can predict very easily the closed form. But going in the opposite direction is sometimes harder. I have to acknowledge that. OK. So talking about, you know, remember, that was the first example I showed. So this is the uh, Gruyad bacterial chaperonin, composed of two rings. There is, this is the top view. You, you see it's a ring. And this is the side view, the uh, lower ring and upper ring called transensis. OK. Uh, each ring is heptameric. It has seven subunits. Seven subunits here, seven subunits there, overall 14. Okay? And from top, it is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven okay. subunits. Now, I'm focusing on two of them, shown here, just enlarged. These two, these two may undergo, you can see that the difference between this one and this one. So that's one confirmation, and that's another one. Actually, that's the confirmation it assumes when it binds ATP, okay, more extended. So this is ATP bound. It's an ATP regulated machine, if you like. And this is unbound. So look at the difference between those pairs. And you can see the same thing here. Each, each subunit contains three domains uh, colored in different names here. Uh, and you can see how it undergoes a change, structural change. So the, the one is the relax, the other is the tense form again. Similar to hemoglobin, these are called R and T forms. Now the question is, this type of structural change, in this case, it's a homohexamer, which means all subunits are identical. And it's like a domino effect. You know, when one of them binds an ATP, it's very likely to bind immediately because it undergoes, a, a, there's a structural change which propagates and all of the subunits are now have a high predisposition to bind ATP. They're already prepared, right? In, of course, the, this is for bacteria. The mammalian counterpart of that is much more complicated. It gets heterogeneous, there is no such symmetry, and uh, things get more complicated. But at least with bacteria, we can <laughs> life is somehow uh, easier to model. So we have uh, all the units that simultaneously move. Now, how can we reproduce that uh, transition between the R and T states with the help of R modes? Okay. So these are this is for experiments. Now, from experiments between those two forms, I can define a d vector, like a distance or deformation between those two forms. How each individual residue changes in space. Okay. This is my experimental deformation vector between the two forms. Now, what I would like to do, this is a three-dimensional vector, right? What do I want to do? <laughs> Can you guess? I want to compare this three-dimensional vector with my predictions, of course. Each eigenvector was a three-dimensional uh, displacement. I want to compare with each eigenvector, each mode of motion and try to see whether any mode shows a high overlap with that. Okay? That's what we've done. So A and M will uh, re yield a series of uh, mode 1, 2, 3, etc. And then I want to see whether uh, uh, these are the respective frequencies, and I want to see the comparison. So this, uh, this is mode 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, etc. And this is the correlation cosine between my mode and the experimentally observed deformation. Here, look at that. The first mode yields a correlation coefficient of 0.8. So it is literally the same uh, movement. It, the transition between R and T is simply accounted for by this mode. Plus, there is some contribution from all others. 
And if you sum them up, it sums up to one, of course. But it's already 80% accomplished by a single mode. Rema this uh, bacterial chaperonin is composed of about 8,000 residues, okay? Huge structure. And this means 24,000 modes. Out of 24,000 modes, <laughs> we have one that is already explaining 80% of the transition. No need to complicate our life. Just look at a few top ranking modes. So we have written several reviews, several applications like that. Uh, the softest mode in this case allows for a, this le level of correlation. And then if I look at that mode, what is interesting, remember I was showing you the interface between the two rings in the very beginning? What it does in this mode, the, uh, there is a change in the registration of the two upper and lower rings. Now what happened that the lab of Helen Sable, they did uh, a substitution here at the interface. The substitution was uh, this one. What happens is that when it moves, uh, the red and blue co refer to positively and negatively charged residues that form salt bridges, right? But because of that substitution, now there is a new, uh, this forms a new partnership here. It changes its interacting residue and it gets in this mutant it, get, it just closely interacts with this new partner and gets stuck there so it cannot undergo the fluctuation movement and indeed experimentally that's what they have observed the structure that has been crystallized instead of being located like that you can see it's already slightly shifted the way the two subunits are registered and it's also stuck in that form it cannot do its allosteric function so that's how, you know, by examining what is happening here, we may start to uh, make predictions about what the effect of a given mutation might be, because that residue, if uh, it is substituted by something that... Uh, so uh, the motions, they alter their, the inter-residue pairs that are interacting. And now, uh, if this is located at a critical site between, you know, the interface of the two domains, now you are really uh, changing the mechanics. All right. Ensemble analysis is the last thing I will explain today. Sorry. Yes. Sorry, asking too many questions. Oh, I w I'm very happy you are asking many questions. Um, so I'm still stuck with the modes. Yes. So when you say we have 8,000 residues, so we have 24,000 that's that right. Means, does, it, does it mean that, for example, you get the first residue and it can move in X, Y, and Z? And then you say, what happens here? I want to go with the X for the first residue and look at all other residues if they move with it or not? Yeah. Is that yeah. how you... So then how do you get that mode that creates the... Okay. How do you get that? Each mode. Mm -hmm. Each mode is a three-dimensional vector. Okay, so in each mode, all of the residues, they have their own delta x, delta y, delta z. The way we generate movies is, so delta x, uh, you, it varies from minus delta x to plus delta x. And we generate all the intermediate conformations, so it moves back and forth, okay? Uh, now, in each mode, the first three is due moves, uh, let's say, pick a single mode, K, okay? In mode K, the raised due one moves along that X, Y, Z. There is due two along that one, along. So you have uh, the each mode describing the movement of the entire structure, okay? Each, each mode is, is an entire, uh, each mode is an entire structure for the entire, because it, the mode is not just the movement of a single residue along the axis. It is a, these are called collective modes. Collective because they collectively engage the entire structure. But the first mode is the most cooperative. It engages everything. The last mode will be single, you know, the, the way I showed the mode profile, peaks at individual sites, which are, just undergoing a bit, very small, 
high frequency vibrations. Okay. And after calculating all of these modes, yeah. Yeah, when you calculate all the modes, uh, when you calculate the eigenvectors, you can simultaneously calculate what is the weight of each mode, which is the inverse eigenvalue. And you can also calculate the co collectivity, because from the mode profile, you can immediately calculate the collectivity with the mode score. Okay? Yes, <laughs> James and then you. So the question is, uh, where do we stop with soft modes? Is this the question? No, but how do, how do, we, how do we know which uh, soft modes to calculate them in the first place? So we can actually, we can actually say let's calculate them in the first That's a good question. So we have so many modes, so 24,000 modes. Each mode has its own weight, given by inverse eigenvalue. Okay. Now, if you would like, we, we usually say the first one, two, five, 20 modes. Up to 20 modes is usually good. Uh, now, if you calculate the weight of individual modes and divide by the sum of all weights, you can already uh, see that by taking the top, uh, depending on the size of your protein, but a small subset will already account for a large portion of the <laughs> So that, that gives you an idea about how many you would like to take. But you don't have to choose any mode either. You can see them, you know, the way we do in CoMD, you can see them as accessible motions. And we have, uh, I'm, I'm not, I was not going to go into that, but you can simulate the dynamics by s selecting each mode in a, through a Monte Carlo iteration procedure using the weight for each mode. And then you can see the superposition combination of all modes. However, in that case, automatically, you're going to have this, a higher contribution from slow modes by default. Um, I have a question. When you have a mutation, so we are taking in account the alpha carbons, right? Very good question. <laughs> So when we have a mutation, we still have exactly the same thing. Very good, very good. So yeah. So uh, what was your name again? Julie. Uh, Julie is asking a great question, and I, uh, everybody should ask. Now, everything was based on alpha carbons. We got all the mode shapes on based on alpha carbons. How can we see the effect of mutations? Because it's only alpha carbons. That's great. We don't, actually. We don't know. The only thing we can say using this theory, there are variations where, which, where people take uh, atom-specific or residue-specific force constants. We're not doing that. We're doing the simplest thing. The only thing I can say is that site is important. That site, that position, whatever the residue is there, would not tolerate mutations. And then I can look more carefully what is that site doing and what would be the effect. But that's like a first guidance to give me a map of the intrinsic properties of that architecture. Now, if you would like really uh, to understand the specific chemically, everything is mechanical here. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want more chemistry, because we're talking about mechanochemical entities, right? Now, then you start to do molecular dynamic simulations. <laughs> you can observe that region. You can do more specific things. But even in this previous example, I knew that that particular site is uh, important. Or I can, you know, the current dynamics lets you build the entire structure. Now you have a new, uh, you have a deformed backbone, right? For that deformed background, we are now able to build the entire structure and let the side chains also relax to adjust. Now, you can compare the original and the new structure. So we have, uh, this requires an extra step, further analysis. But at least it can tell you at first sight that, OK, this is a critical region. And now you would like to look more closely what's happening there. Okay. Okay. The one was, uh, I'm sorry, I have another one. That's great. Uh, that was a great question. I hope everyone uh, appreciated it. <laughs> So Back another one is um, when you have the first mode, you have the more 
the one. Yeah, you have what? The fifth month. Okay. The, the yeah. But that one, no, another one. So <laughs> if I have the yeah. first one and the second one and the third one, and I want to do that movie, so I can see, no. You so can, yeah. So I can see different. No, you can see one mode at a time. You can see one mode at a time, mode one, mode two, mode three. But there is another. Uh, extension that we have uh, developed and which I call co-MD, collective MD, where we are uh, successively letting the molecule move along those different modes, what I was trying. So you can generate a simulation, then it is a simulation and you take advantage of the individual modes as collective steps for your molecule. But for the movies, uh, of course you can generate a movie for such a trajectory also, for such a simulation. But the movies that you see in the ANM server, Dynamics, Prodi, they are all single individual modes. Individual. Yes. No, we have individual modes in the server. Yeah. You have a question? I'm sorry? No, you can't see the movie. No, you can't see the movie. You can discuss that. <laughs> So, I yeah. Have a about the topic. So, in your previous example, you mentioned that uh, mode one is the smallest mode. Is, is, is this the definition, or the mode one is just uh, one of the modes of the residue one? I'm sorry, tell me again. Um, in your previous slide, you mentioned that uh, mode one yeah. is, is the smallest. Uh, softest. Soft, softest mode. That's right. Yeah. Mode one has nothing to do with residue one. Each mode uh, involves all the residues. Okay. Each mode is a co uh, is a collective mode that involves all of them. Okay. Mode one is simply the most cooperative, the softest motion where everything is moving more uh, concertedly. Mode two will be less cooperative. Mode three less, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is by definition, but there are some cases where this order may be slightly changed. Uh, and if you would like to rigorously calculate the extent of collectivity of each mode, you can do that. And you can, uh, you can select then the most collective modes, which may be mode two in some cases. But selecting the most collective modes is usually more, more is a very informative thing because the most, more collective the mode, the more functionally significant it is, usually. Yeah, usually, uh, you know, by definition, you invert, uh, you do the eigenvalue decomposition of the entire matrix. So simultaneously, you calculate all of them by definition. But there are also methods to just calculate subsets. But the standard procedure is when you invert it, you simultaneously evaluate all the eigenvalues and all the eigenvectors, each eigenvector being a mode. Now, for very big sparse matrices, it is possible to calculate the top ranking modes, but it would be, uh, it, would not, it, it becomes a mathematical trick there. Okay. Yes, I have a, a couple of questions. I'll go in that order. <laughs> Yes. And this model can predict how it is evolved. So it may evolve from this structure to this structure, as you showed us compared to your experiment. Yeah. But in this structure, the connectivities are already different from this structure. So are you adapting your matrix? Or my question is, can I use this model intuitively to predict the overall motion? That's a very good point. Actually, uh, it is. Uh, you know, when I was talking about the simulations where you do successive modes, these are also called exactly, as you said, adaptive uh, simulations. What we would be doing is you move along a given mode. Now you have a deformed structure. And you put there all the amino acids, now side chains. You t let it relax, energy minimize. And now it has a new, it reached a new minimum. 
Now you reconstruct your network, uh, your ANM, Kirchhoff Hessian matrix. You generate a new mode. So if you would like to carry out a non-equilibrium uh, simulation, a transition event, it, uh, you need to do this type of adaptive. Uh, and by the way, we did that with Klaus Schulten in 2008, the original paper where we used uh, applied to Rhodopsin. We have a paper in 2008, and since then, we have uh, further developed and used in many applications this type of MD simulations, which are accelerated by using nor those modes to. Uh, so it is a little bit like targeted or steered MD, but now you push your molecule along those collective motions. And each time you let it relax, you reconstruct it. Each time you evaluate what the target is going to be, you see what I mean? So there is a, 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 this is a use, very useful uh, way of exploring uh, transitions. We've done that a lot. But I'm not, it's not within the scope of this <laughs> workshop. You had a question? Can we what? Yeah, you can uh, focus wherever you like, of course. But uh, it is better to not to hypothesize anything and then just run it for your system and uh, try to observe what are the strongest signals. As I mentioned, what are the sensors? What are the effectors? What are the hinge sites? Uh, so dynamics, for example, it, there is an option. It tells you what are the most uh, key mechanical sites, we call that, the most functional sites. So it is, if you know already uh, some important sites, you can focus on them, of course. But suppose you don't know anything, and now you have a structure, and you want to understand what the structure can potentially do. So it is better not to, you know, at least if you don't. It depends on the way you would like to interpret, but you can look at, without any bias, just uh, explore what it's doing. You have a question? I'll go back to what Julia was asking you about just looking at the outcome. Does it then ignore hyperplasticity, ignore pulse movement, and things like that? We don't have these things in the model. We don't have hydrophobicity, we don't have salt bridges. This is after the fact. You know, first we generate, we find, oh, this is a critical site. There is a redistribution of interactions there when it moves along that mode. What are the interactions? What are those critical interactions? And what happens if I substitute something here in the first conformation and then deformed conformation? So we start to look at specific specificities after that, at that point. But when you say what happens if you substitute something, you're talking about making mutations. For example, yeah, of course. Of course, yeah, yeah we, the, the, uh, the cur you can build the side chains. Now you have, you have the original, you have the backbone. Now for that architecture, the backbone is likely to move like that. But the, w the assumption is that the backbone, the overall architecture has its own character, and then the side chains will readjust. So now you have a deformed structure, and in that deformed structure, we can reconstruct the entire full atomic description. So currently dynamics server, it gives you the full atomic description of those structures deformed along the modes. So now you have a starting equilibrium structure, you have a alternative, uh, you know, I call it deformed, but this is not a bad thing. It is a reconfigured shape of the same structure. Again, at full atomic resolution, and you can download the new PDB coordinates generated. You can visualize it. You can do uh, all sorts of analysis. OK, it's getting very interesting. You, you won't let me finish my lecture. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I hope uh, everybody is benefiting from the questions. OK, yes. Um, it's kind of based on what people asked before. So you mentioned that there's a cut-off distance when you are interconnecting to alpha carbon. So going from a bound state to an unbound state or vice versa, the 
connection between alpha carb and is also going to change based on the distance that it's, I believe the distance is going to change. So how do you account for that? Yeah. Uh, so the question is, uh, I spoke about a cutoff distance for building the network. Now between bound and unbound forms, the cutoff dis uh, the distance, there are distance changes, so the connectivity changes. Uh, how do we account for that? That's the question. Okay, so we, we don't account for that. We start with a given structure in a given net as a network. And we try to see, uh, and there are, I can give you a few reviews, but uh, ideally we try to see uh, uh, what will be the alternative confirmations. Now in those alternative confirmations, you can, if you like, further push them and to see where they would be further moving by reconstructing your network. So that's again the same question in an adaptive way. So you have a first step. Now you have a new confirmation, you build again your network model, you have a new confirmation, etc. So this is the adaptive procedure. But for the prediction of where it's going to go, we base it only on the starting connectivity. You can update it if you want to push it further in that direction. Usually we want to be around the equilibrium state. So, but uh, again, there are many papers where we have done that type of adaptive uh, non-equilibrium events, succession of events. Yes, this is the last question. Okay. <laughs> you won't let me finish my lecture. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> now everything I explained today, these are instantly done. Yeah, that's the beauty of it. The simplicity and efficiency, these are the two uh, beauty. <laughs> oh, absolutely. You can see immediately the results. If you are do dealing with a system of, let's say, a few hundreds of raised juice, it's instantly. If you're dealing with a system of a few thousands of raised juice, it may take a couple of minutes. <laughs> but that's the time scale of these operations. That is, that is the big, uh, that's what motivated us in the first place. You know, uh, Originally, when we introduced the computing uh, power was even worse. And uh, we wanted to, you know, rather than waiting for, our, uh, for days, weeks, months, for some trajectories and then running multiple si uh, simulations. Now this, you, you get results instantly here. Yeah. This is not a simulation, it's an analytical solution, unique solution for each structure in a sense. That's the input. Exactly, that's all. <laughs> but you can turn it into a simulation if you want to explore larger uh, excursions from the original equilibrium state. You can turn it into a simulation. Now, one thing you didn't ask me <laughs> is you, you said you take two structures, you, ta you d deform the first, and then you find the second one. You, know, you can uh, confirm that along a given mode, one of the softest modes, mode one, two, or three, by moving along that mode, you obtain structure B uh, for the same protein. But a better comparison uh, is that there is the, the, the same protein doesn't usually have only two structures. And there may be multiple structures in the PDB. You know, originally when they were doing the structural genomics effort, the goal was to determine one representative structure for each protein. And what happened, they determined multiple structures for some proteins that were easily crystallized or resolved. That's a good thing. Now, for there are many, many proteins in the PDB for which you have multiple structures. So you have ensembles of structures. And this ensemble of structures actually give you exactly what I'm trying to describe, you know, how you move away from your equilibrium. Now, you don't have to even define two endpoints, which may be totally artificial. For example, in an iosteric cycle of the Groyer, it may be visiting already six, seven different confirmations. There, is a, there may be a continuum of confirmations. 
so you would like to see what experimental data gave us all the ensemble of structures that have been resolved for a given protein, and then compare whether these relate to our modes. You see what I mean? So that's the ensemble comparison that I'm talking about. So there are more than two endpoints, but there, are, uh, there is uh, an ensemble of structures. So the original ideas actually uh, they were in this very old paper almost two decades ago. <coughs> I was <coughs> intrigued by, you know, this is HIV reverse transcriptase, all of them. HIV reverse transcriptase, but look at that. So this was, remember, this was the thumb. And this is the finger. So the thumb can move closer to the finger. Here is the uh, dinucleotide uh, segment that's being processed. So the same structure can assume multiple forms. And then we wanted to see, uh, we can learn from them, actually. If you examine those multiple structures, you can already learn what the structure can undergo, right? But we can compare with our predictions. So we can have ensembles of structures based on uh, you know, what happens when there is a substrate binding uh, or a drug binding, ligand binding. So this P38 MAP kinase, which is an important drug target, at that time it had 182 structures in the presence of different inhibitors. So uh, then you have an ensemble like that, which you can superimpose. This was ubiquitin, by the way. Uh, we like that structure very much and adopted this as our icon <laughs> for protein. And, or you can have, as I mentioned, multiple structures along an allosteric cycle. Well, so it's not, uh, am I going backwards? Okay. So what we are doing is uh, take a given protein. We can do a principal component analysis of the ensemble of structures that are already known. And we can do our A&M analysis of the single structure and then compare the two. So let me explain better. When we compare the two, what we generate, uh, the, the violet arrows are based on this ensemble of experimental structures. We call it experimental data. And the first mode in this case is the violet arrow. When we take just one structure, just a representative uh, average structure, if you like. And do our AM analysis as well, we obtain the uh, green arrows. So that gives you uh, the soft part, the softest mode. So that gives you or a few other examples. So that is the, uh, that's to us even more meaningful than being able to go between two endpoints. But for the entire ensemble, the dominant mode of motion from principal component analysis or that we predict for from a single structure, a and analysis, overlap, okay? That was a paper, again, from uh, Ahmed, who, and that, uh, we published that in 2009, and that actually motivated us to build a interface that would be doing this type of calculations for everybody, because we found it so useful. And afterwards, you know, this was published in 2009. We started, uh, we published the first PRODI paper in 2011 with Ahmed. So what's the ensemble analysis? Uh, you will see application in the afternoon. You have an ensemble. It could be NMR models. You know, when they resolve a structure by NMR, they deposit multiple models. Each of them, if you ask an NMR spectroscopist, they are not going to say this model is better than the other. They are all equally probable. They are all accessible confirmations, but that they also give us information on the confirmational variability. Okay? Or you can have the X-ray structures, again, like the P38 that I mentioned in different ligands, et cetera. Or you can do the same thing with MD simulations. You can have MD snapshots, different frames, and now you have an ensemble of confirmations. And you can do what's called an essential dynamics analysis to obtain the principal modes of uh, structural change from the empty trajectories. So you can uh, use anything as an input. Prudy allows you to use any of these. You can just enter the PDB code of a structure resolved by NMR. You get an ensemble. 
you can upload the PMD trajectories. It's going to do the same type of analysis. So it, it, there are all those options. And the output, the output will be uh, the principal modes of conformational variation. For example, in NMR, what are the diff differences between the NMR models, for example? <laughs> or what are the rearrangements change under different functional states? Ligand bound, unbound, in the presence of a substrate, ATP bound, unbound, etc. Open, closed. If for membrane proteins, you have outward facing, inward facing, you know, the many alternating axis model trend. And also, you can do for the dynamics observed in simulations. So, you can do this type of ensemble analysis. This is called principal component analysis. The principal modes of motions that you obtain from principal component analysis are equivalent to the ANM, the modes of motions that we obtain from our connectivity matrix or Hessian. Okay. So the method is you superimpose structures. Prodi does that for you. Uh, Jihan is going to show that. You evaluate the covariance matrix. Actually, what you're doing in this case, when you have an ensemble of structures, you can calculate what is the mean average structure and how much each of those structures deviate from the mean. So you, ha you, you know the covariance matrix now from that ensemble. Remember, the covariance was the inverse of the Kirchhoff matrix or inverse of the Hessian. So you are now we are approaching from the other end. Uh, from the, uh, on the ensemble gives you the covariance. You can decompose the covariance into eigenvalues, eigenvectors, which will be the same eigenvalues and eigenvectors as the Kirchhoff matrix, okay? Or Hessian. Okay, that's what I said. So you got the covariance matrix now from the ensemble. Uh, and uh, from that covariance matrix for HIV reverse transcriptase, for example, the principal component analysis is going to give you from the ensemble of structures, and I don't know how many, but a few hundreds, this is what it gives you. This, the relative movements of the finger domain and uh, thumb domain of the polymerase uh, subunit. You see the arrows, right? And uh, for those of you who were asking how much each mode contributes, in this principal component analysis, this first mode, when you take the inverse eigenvalue relative to all inverse eigenvalues, it is 47%. Single mode contributes 47% to the distribution of confirmations. So that's from uh, ensemble analysis. But then you can do the same thing from theory using the ANM. And you get exactly the same type of movements, see, along the. So this is the structure, how the structure looks like. And this is the most uh, dominant m mode of motion, you know, the relative movements of these two regions. What is amazing is that the structures in the PDB most of the structures, uh, if you uh, place them along this principal component, uh, they are different extents of deformation along this principal mode, actually. Or along, this was ANM mode 2, ANM 2. So you can, uh, you can uh, after all, what we are observing are structures that have all moved along a soft mode to different extents, and the correlation between the two is about 0.99, which is amazing, actually, to me. <laughs> so we have many such examples, and I'm going to just, one, the top one is based on NMR models, and NMR models, and again, this one, uh, different in inhibitor. So the correlation may be slightly weaker, but uh, it is still uh, to our view excellent. So PRODI, which you will see in the afternoon, uh, this is the way you operate. Uh, you don't even, in this case, you don't even need to know the PDB code. Suppose you have a certain sequence you are interested in. You can enter the sequence. And then it's going to go to the PDB 
and find all the structures that contain that sequence. And you can even define the sequence identity threshold. You can say up to 80%. So it's going to retrieve an ensemble of PDB structures that contain that sequence with uh, up to 80%, 80 or 100, you know, above 80% identical. Now you have an ensemble of structures. Even that part is very important, you know, to, to be able to retrieve from the PDB all the structures that match that, your query sequence. Now you have an ensemble. You have an ensemble of structures, and then you can uh, superpose them. The PDB will superimpose them, structurally align them. And from that structural alignment of those uh, of the, this segment in different structures, you know what your segment, what type of conformational variability it has. Or you can also just do the A&M &M analysis for one of them. And then you compare the modes. Uh, there may be some change in the orders of modes. The first mode of one will be the second of the other, etc. Now, to coming back to your question, it is possible. So each point here, the blue points, represent the uh, PDB structures, each of them projected into, onto this uh, subspace of the two principal modes. Okay. The red points here are what we generate as the a &M ensemble based on one structure here. So the a &M ensemble will include the uh, PDB structures, as you can see here. And it's slightly broader. And then we have also shown that in some cases, again, this is the blue region, right? If you perform MD simulations, MD simulations may sample these uh, black points. They may move into a region. There is a common sampling inaccuracy problem. They may be sampling a region of the subspace which is not completely overlapping with the ensemble. But with a and we, uh, we have shown time and time again that we do sample the large conformational space. So the, uh, you will see this type of applications. The major advantages of Prodi, I'm finishing almost, it is its simplicity. You can visualize the global motions. You can apply it to very large systems. You can assess what the cooperative motions are. It's very efficient. And you know, to us, the most important part was that we can relate what we observe to functional mechanisms and Alice theory. What about the disadvantages? It's a low resolution approach. If you want uh, details, <laughs> especially if you're doing quantum chemical studies, it's not for you. <laughs> uh, it could be a, just a first uh, screening, but not. Uh, so there are no specific interactions, at least in the version that I explained today. We don't have atomic details, but we can reconstruct them, as I explained. After all, everything that I explained today, not the core MD, you know, adaptive simulations, but the equilibrium, is just what happens near the equilibrium conditions, under physiological conditions. And our starting point is structural data, obviously. We need to have an architecture, a structure, to be able to start to make predictions. We're not predicting structure. We are predicting the dynamics of the structure. So this is the core MD that I mentioned. So uh, to answer your, uh, this was the original paper I mentioned with Klaus. Uh, so essentially, you are sampling transition pathways guided by the a and modes. Uh, and we've done uh, a series of them. The one with Benoit Rui is being cited a lot recently. This is the one we like to use the most, uh, which we found most useful, CoMD. Co stands for collective modes, MD for MD. Mart was the Prostak who did that, he's already an associate professor uh, after leaving my lab uh, two years ago. And here is, uh, you, what you can do with this method is to sample the conformational space very accurately, so along the two principal directions of motion or any order parameter that you can generate. So we can build this type of energy landscapes 
Okay, I will stop here. That's it today. The rest is applications, <laughs> which you will see. <laughs>